Good afternoon, everybody. A little breaking news, I don't know if you've heard. The governor of New Jersey, Christie, says parents should have a choice on whether to vaccinate their kids. According to the New York Times, amid an outbreak of measles that has spread across 14 states, Governor Chris Christie of New Jersey said Monday that parents need to have some measure of choice about vaccinating their children against the virus, breaking with the president and much of the medical profession. So this is why I teach this course. Someday one of you is going to be a governor or a senator or a congressperson or something elected, and you're not going to make a stupid statement like that, okay? You promise, <laughs> you promise me? Because if you do, I will get in touch with you and say, hey, didn't you learn anything? Well, when we talk about vaccination, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more as well. All right, today, we've just gone through three lectures in this course where we just have overviews of replication and assays of viruses, some general principles. Now we're gonna start diving into nitty gritty Okay, and we're going to start by looking how viruses are built. They're, they are really pretty neat entities, and today I want to tell you the principles of structure. I brought a few viruses with me to show you. So these are called giant microbes. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of these guys. You can buy them at your Hallmark store or anywhere. And I like them because they make people uh, cognizant of viruses. They have a little card which explains a little bit about it. This is polio. And you're going to see today that this is pretty accurate with the exception of the eyes, right? Uh, they put it there so they're cute and kids want to buy them. That's fine with me because if kids buy it, then they'll read it and they'll ask their parents things. So that's polio and structurally pretty good. We also have HIV. It also has eyes. Um, but, and it's got the red uh, thing there as well. This is wrong, okay, the structure is totally wrong. If you notice, polio and HIV look similar. You'll see today, they have what we call icosahedral shapes. That's fine for polio, but HIV is not icosahedral, all right? So if you go on the, on the internet and search for HIV, you'll get lots of images of it as an icosahedron, but it's an envelope virus that doesn't have such uh, structure as that. And then finally, this is a scientific model of polio. And uh, this you could make, if you had a 3D printer, you could print one of these out because the coordinates are all available, as you'll see today, in three dimensions. Now this is very cool because inside it is actually the RNA. <laughs> and it's this, the RNA of polio is 7,442 bases long. I know that by heart because I did it over 30 years ago. And a, a virologist friend of mine beaded it. The entire sequence is beaded. So each base is a different color. There are four bases. And she put it all together, all 740,442 bases in the right order. And um, as we talk about um, replication and uncoding, we'll look more into this model. What's really cool is that, well, this thing is about 30 meters long, I think. And um, it's all packed in here very nicely. And you'll see later on, you know, it would take me about a minute to get this out of here. But in a cell, the RNA comes out in less than a second. So obviously, some magic is going on there that we don't understand. So the virus particles, one of their functions, as you can see from this model, is to protect the genome. But they have other functions as well. Let's start talking about that. So uh, they have to assemble a stable protein shell, which is what I'm showing you right here. They have to recognize and package the nucleic acid genome. So we'll talk later. To get the nucleic acid into the particle requires sequences on the RNA as well as on the protein. So the proteins that make up this capsid have to recognize the genome. Uh, when these viruses infect cell uh, and they're produced, some of them have envelopes, as you will see, and, or membranes derived from the host cell. So the viral proteins drive that formation of that envelope. All right, some other functions, they have to deliver the genome to the host cell. So they have to bind to receptors on the host cell, which is, we'll talk about on Wednesday. They have to help the genome get out of the particle. And as I said, this particle uh, it takes me a minute or more to get the RNA out, but it happens in a second in the cell. So all that kind of ability is encoded in the, the structural proteins. Some, some viruses that have envelopes, like uh, 
vesicular stomatitis or rabies virus up here on the upper left. Their membranes derive from the host cell. The way the RNA gets out of those is the membrane fuses and the RNA pops out. We'll talk about that on Wednesday. But again, the, the viral proteins drive that process. And finally, once the genome is in the cell, uh, typically they uncoat in the cytoplasm, but not always. They have to go to the right place wherever that may be, elsewhere in the cytoplasm or the nucleus. And again, the structural proteins drive that. So there are lots of functions of structural proteins beyond just protecting the particle. Of course, all the viruses floating around in this room remain stable because they have a shell that protects them. So that's not the only function. Now, when we talk about virus structure, we use terminology that I want you to understand simply so you know what I'm talking about. And this is actually the last one. Virion is something I should introduce on the first day because I use it. And what I mean when I say a virion is the infectious virus particle, not just any virus particle. Because as we talked last time, uh, not every virus particle is infectious. It doesn't make it through the infectious cycle. That's the particle to PFU ratio. So a virus stock is made up of lots and lots of virus particles, some of which are infectious. Those are the virions, and the rest are just virus particles. Now starting at the top, uh, subunit is a single fo folded polypeptide chain. So when I talk about viral subunits, I just mean a single uh, protein, such as diagram here. So here's a diagram of poliovirus, and that's, of course, the virus that's on the table here. Uh, and the subunits are actually um, the, the individual colored regions of this model, green, blue, and red. Uh, and up there, they have a slightly different color, blue, red, and yellow. But those uh, are the polyproteins, the subunits. The structural unit is the unit uh, that is used to build capsids or nuclear capsids. It can be one subunit. So for some viruses, the structural unit is one polypeptide. For other viruses, it's more. So for polio, for example, it's, it's four. And you can see three of them here, blue, yellow, and red. We'll go into this more detail. The capsid is the protein shell surrounding the genome. So this on the upper right, the polio virus is a capsid. Uh, this polio, of course, and its plastic relative, these are both capsids. Um, so that's really what we mean when we say it's, it's from the Latin word meaning box. We use another phrase called nucleocapsid, which you can see has the word capsid in it. So that's also surrounding. But that means the nucleic acid protein assembly within the virion. This will be more obvious as we talk about it today, but in the rabies virus particle, for example, Inside is the nucleic acid, all wrapped up, complex with a protein, and that's the nucleocapsid. Uh, the envelope or the viral membrane, that's the envelope around the particle. So for rabies virus, that very outer, lightly colored uh, structure is the envelope, and it's derived from the host cell. And finally, the virion is the infectious virus particle. So these are the terms we'll be using as we talk about uh, how to build viruses. And just to remind you that the scale that virus size is on, uh, a nanometer, of course, we use nanometers to talk about dimensions in virology a, a lot. You know, I say polio is 30 nanometers in diameter. So that's 10 to the minus 9 meters, of course. And just for reference, an alpha helix in a protein is about a nanometer in diameter. So the smallest viruses Polioviruses. So this guy up here, this is, would be 30 nanometers in diameter, uh, is about 30 times the diameter of a polypeptide chain, an alpha helix specifically. DNA is a little thicker than, than the alpha helix, 2 nanometers. And of course, ribosomes are, are slightly smaller than uh, polioviruses. And viruses get very big. They go over 1,000 nanometers. Uh, Pandora virus is 1,000 nanometers, and there are others that are slightly bigger. Okay, Just to give you a perspective, because I put these models on the table, it's not really indicative of how big they are. Now, before we go through talking about how viruses are built, they're really amazing particles. There's a concept that you have to really understand, and that is that we say virus particles are metastable. I'm always talking about the stability of particles in an environment, but they're really metastable. And that means that they have two states. They're, they have a stable state, and the state that's circulating in you or that's in the air on surfaces has to protect the genome. So it has to, the particle has to be very, very stable. But it can't be so stable that it doesn't give up the genome, so to speak. The genome has to get out. For some viruses, they fall apart. For some viruses, they open up pores and so forth. 
but they have to have a state that is less stable. And that's why we call them metastable. So that's diagrammed here. For poliovirus, we have very stable uh, virus particles that are binding to cell receptors. And then they have to, at some point, become destabilized, which is shown here by the different color, uh, to let the RNA out into the cell. And exactly what happens during this de destabilization process we'll talk about on Wednesday. Now, another way to look at this issue, this metastability, is in terms of the free energy. So you know, biological systems like, like to reach their free energy, the state which for a protein we would call the native state where it has the least amount of energy, uh, the G number, the G value. So it's the same with viruses. They tend towards a low free energy state, but the virus particle that is infecting a cell, the stable poliovirus, that has not reached its minimum free energy state. So it's not all the way at the lowest energy value that it can attain. So if you look at this in terms of a graph, where we're looking at energy versus uh, time, virus particles typically exist here in this little trough. They have a higher free energy state than the final state, which is the, the uncoding or the state that's liberating the genome. To get from one to three ha requires energy. So virus particles don't automatically go from their free state to the lowest energy state. That wouldn't make sense because they'd be floating around in the air releasing their genome because that's what the, the low free energy state, state is associated with. The way this happens is that there is energy built into the particle during assembly. So we call viruses spring-loaded in a way. We set a spring during assembly and that potential energy remains in the particle. That's why it has a high free energy state. And then when the virus encounters the right cell, and this is the key, it has to be a cell in which it can replicate, that energy is released and it allows the particle to then surmount this energy barrier shown by the two here and get to the low um, energy minimum, all right? So if in the right cell, the energy that has been stored in the particle, number one, uh, is released upon a cell signal and that allows progression to the low energy state and that's where the virus particle uncoats, okay? So how do we do this? How do we make a metastable particle, one that is really stable in the environment that'll protect the genome as the particle goes around but then can come apart on the right signals? Well, we make stable structures, as you will see today. We use many copies of identical proteins to make a, a stable structure and these proteins, by virtue of being repeated, have a lot of contact with each other. And that gives you a very stable particle. And so as we talk about the different kinds of particles today, a, a very important feature is that they're made with repeating subunits, and they make the subunits make maximal contact, and that gives you a stable particle. But the way we make it unstable is that those subunits are not covalently bound to one another. So all the subunits that make up a virus particle, that poliovirus particle on the table, for example, they're not covalently bound. And so that means they can come apart on the right signal. They can come apart, they can enter the f lowest free energy state, the minimum free energy state, and the viral nucleic acid can come out. So that's how we, are meta that's how we create metastability in a particle. We make a very stable particle that's not covalently bound, uh, where the subunits are not covalently bound. All right, the first uh, question is, viral capsids are metastable because they must protect the viral genome outside of the cell. They must come apart and release the genome into a cell. They have not obtained a minimum free energy confirmation. They're spring-loaded and all of the above. 89% of you got all of the above. And it's true because everything is correct. They have to protect the genome. They must come apart. They have not obtained minimum free energy confirmation. They're spring-loaded. Each one of those is correct. I told you earlier that if you had a, a 3D printer, you could print out one of these polioviruses, and that's because we have the, the coordinates. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we, how we learn what the structure of these viruses is. Um, and these are the tools of structural biology, electron microscopy, x-ray crystallography, electron cryo microscopy, which is also called cryo-EM, and a more recent version of that, uh, cryo, electron cryotomography. 
and then nuclear magnetic resonance. And uh, I'll just go through a couple of these because uh, we use a lot of structures in this course and you should know how they're derived. Now electron microscopy was developed in the 1930s and in 1940 this scientist in Germany uh, took the first pictures of virus particles. They happened to be bacteriophages attaching to E. coli. And um, electron microscopy provided a lot of information for many years. Now the way this works is that to take an electron micrograph of a virus, you have to stain it. But of course, these are very low, uh, these are high magnification images, very small particles. So you can't use a, a dye that would you, you would use to stain tissues or a cell. You have to use a dye that will block electrons. This is called negative staining. All right, you use electron-dense material like uranyl acetate or phosphotungstate, and these scatter electrons, so you're actually shadowing the particle. This was developed in 1959. Now the resolution of electron microscopy is between 50 and 75 <coughs> angstroms, so it's not really good enough to look at an alpha helix, right? Because an alpha helix is a, a, a nanometer in diameter. So you can't get detailed structural information, but for many years we could see what viruses look like. So here's a picture, a composite of a variety of different electron micrographs showing you, you know, you can get some information about how viruses are made. So for example, uh, the, the picture of adenovirus here on the lower left was one of the first uh, to, to show that virus. And you could see that it's, it's got a, a shape which is very characteristic. It's a polyhedral shape and we'll talk about that in a moment, and it had these very interesting projections. Um, here is an envelope virus down below here. It's probably influenza virus, and you can see that uh, the surface of the virus has these projections. So they were called spikes, because they look like spikes here in these electron micrographs, and you'll see what they are today. Here's a herpes virus. Again, you see a polyhedral. This is, this is the nucleocapsid. It has the DNA in it, and this is an envelope around it and a variety of other polyhedral viruses. Here's polio on the upper right. You can see some of them are hollow. They don't have any nucleic acid in them. They're defective. Uh, they probably broke open during preparation. So we could get quite a bit of information from uh, looking at viruses in the electron microscope, but you know, we couldn't get details about the polypeptide chain, which is what we want to be able to study these viruses. So um, cryo-electron microscopy can do this. And this is a really neat technique where you take virus particles frozen in water. You don't stain them at all. The freezing in water gives them enough contrast so that you can see them. And you can see them at the top here. And then you take individual pictures of hundreds and hundreds of particles, with the idea being each one is in a slightly different orientation. And then you use software and, and math to create an image. It's sort of like a CAT scan where the X-ray machine rotates around the human and all the images are combined to make a three-dimensional structure. That's the same thing as with a cryo-electron microscopy. So here you can see you take individual particles, you do a Fourier transformation, uh, and then you combine them eventually into a merged transform. You reverse it and you get the three-dimensional uh, reconstruction of the virus particle, which is what you can see down here. This began to be used quite a while ago for viruses and it had a resolution of about 10 angstroms, maybe 8 angstroms, but what's really improved it is computational approaches using different software to analyze the data has brought the resolution down where it rivals that of x-ray crystallography as you'll see in a moment. So uh, the, the icon I use on all my online stuff is this. This is the cryo-electron micrograph reconstruction of poliovirus bound to its cellular receptor. The virus is in red and the receptor is in blue. So this is an image reconstruction from <coughs> electron micrographs taken as I've just told you. Uh, we use x-ray crystallography to get higher resolution, although as I say now, many labs have switched entirely to cryo-electron microscopy because you can do just as well. And crystallography is tough because you basically have to make a crystal of your virus. So here, for example, is poliovirus crystal. You can imagine how much virus went to make this. It's a visible crystal that you have to just find the conditions to make. You have to figure out how to get the virus to crystallize. And then you hope that it will give you the data that it wants. So this is a really laborious process. It sometimes works and it sometimes doesn't. Once you have your crystal, uh, you bombard it with x-rays. And the idea is that this is, an, this is now a lattice of the same virus particle over and over again. And the x-rays will bounce off all the atoms. And you collect the reflections uh, on a, a digitizing detector. 
And then you can use that to calculate the actual structure, the three-dimensional structure of the protein. And again, this can be very high resolution, but um, it's very laborious and doesn't always work. The first crystal, the first X-ray structure built of a virus was this one in 1978, tomato bushy stunt virus. It's a plant virus, as you can see. And immediately, you can tell the big difference between this and the electron micrographs. You can see uh, much more surface structure, but in addition, you can trace the alpha uh, backbone chain of the polypeptide, and you can see all the side chains of the amino acids. That's not displayed here, but you can certainly do that. Uh, and we also have the, the structure of poliovirus done in 1985 by X-ray crystallography on the upper left. You can see the individual polypeptide chains. If you zoomed in on this, you could see the side chains as well. And there's the cryo-electron micrograph version. This is about, I don't know, eight angstroms, and the one on the upper left is two angstroms. So that makes all the difference in the world <laughs> at being able to see the individual uh, polypeptides. Nowadays, we can even do structures of the biggest viruses. This is cafeteria rowan bergensis virus. It's one of the giant viruses that I told you about earlier. And this is over 300 nanometers in diameter. So it's 10 times bigger than polio. It has over 15,000 capsid proteins. And this was done by uh, Chuan Chao in uh, UTEP. And he still hasn't published it because uh, it's so complicated he hasn't finished figuring it out. He tells me that when he does this rotation on his computer, it routinely crashes it. He's never found a computer other than a supercomputer that can do it because there's so many millions and millions of atoms uh, in this reconstruction. So we can do amazing uh, structural studies on viruses now. So with that little background, let's talk about the principles of building a virus particle. Now, you may remember, of course, Watson and Crick because they figured out the structure of DNA, right? But you probably didn't know that they made a huge contribution to our understanding of virus structure. Um, and they had been studying this along with studying DNA, and afterwards they studied virus structure. And they published a really important paper where they showed that, th they, they said, here are how viruses are built. And one of their observations was that uh, viruses are either rod-shaped or spherical. At the time, this was correct. Now we know it's a little more complicated, but this provides us a good foundation. They're either rod-shaped or spherical. They are made of usually repeating subunits. And they, their reasoning was because virus genomes are small, they can't encode a lot of structural proteins in them. So they, they encode a few of them and repeat them many, many times older, over. And these interact in a way that is the same throughout the particle. So their final conclusion was um, for the rod-shaped viruses, that's shown over here. This is an e electron micrograph of tobacco mosaic virus, the rod-shaped virus. For those kinds of viruses, uh, the protein subunits are distributed with what they called helical symmetry. So symmetry is going to be the key to building a virus particle. And I we'll explain what this is in a moment. For the round viruses like poliovirus on the right here, the symmetry is built with, a, with the platonic polyhedra, okay? Icosahedral symmetry being the key here. So that's, that was Watson and Crick's <coughs> contribution. So these are the rules now by which these two kinds of viruses are built. So first of all, each subunit has identical bonding contacts with its neighbors. So um, whether this is a helical or a icosahedral built virus, all the subunits interact with each other. And I have identical in quotes here because you will see it's, it's not exactly identical, but we'll explain that in a moment. So you have symmetric arrangements of subunits. They're the same subunit repeated over and over, and these, are, these have complementary surfaces so they make a very stable virus particle. And again, as I told you before, that's rule two, the bonding contacts are non-covalent usually non-covalent. We've, of course, found exceptions, a few exceptions, but what I'm going to tell you today, they're usually non-covalent, and that lets the virus particle come apart, right, so that the nucleic acid can get out. That makes it metastable. All right, these are the symmetry rules that tell you how virus particles assembled that were sorted out by Watson and Crick. Now, even if you don't care about self-assembly, so basically, if you take a virus capsid protein, 
like that, that in this poliovirus here. If you take the individual protein and, and just mix them together, they will self-assemble into a virus particle. So they have information in their primary and secondary structure for self-assembly. Even if you don't care about that, it has practical consequences. We make vaccines nowadays that build upon this finding. So the hepatitis B virus and the human papillomavirus vaccines, which we'll talk about later, these are made in yeast. These are called virus-like particles because all we do is produce the capsid protein. It turns out for these two viruses, there's just one protein that makes up the capsid. It's repeated many, many times over. And if you produce that protein in yeast, it assembles into a virus particle. And those are purified, and that's what the vaccine is. There's no genome in it. So this idea of self-assembly has incredible practical consequences because we can make vaccines using it. All right, so let's start with helical symmetry. This is the first kind of symmetry by which viruses are built. Remember, Watson and Crick said the helical, uh, the rod-shaped viruses are built using helical symmetry. And here on the bottom is our friend again, tobacco mosaic virus, the rod-shaped virus. And what, it's very simple to build this particle. You take a coat protein. In the case of tobacco mosaic virus, the virus is made up of one protein. It's called the coat protein, and they're illustrated as these little uh, yellow, they look like shoes to me. And they're repeated many, many times. They bind to each other, and they bind to the RNA. So in the green in the middle is the viral RNA. The coproteins bind the viral RNA, and then they interact with each other. And the interactions among all the proteins are identical. They have these wonderful chemically uh, complementary surfaces. They do not covalently bond either to each other or to the RNA. They're all non-covalent interactions, so it can all come apart. And then this is coiled around itself to form uh, a helix, basically. And so that's, the, that's an illustration on the right. And on the left is an actual reconstruction uh, of the structure of uh, this virus, and you can see the, the dimensions and so forth. So these are each pro coat protein subunits, and inside of it is the nucleic acid. So we, coat protein molecules engage in identical equivalent interactions with one another and with the genome, and that's how you get this very stable particle. So all these interactions, think about it, repeated over and over, that's what makes it so stable. This turns out to be the, the virus for, of tobacco mosaic virus, it's just a naked uh, RNA protein complex. It goes from plant to plant and infects the plants. However, this kind of helical <coughs> symmetry is found throughout uh, the virus kingdom. And I, if you have these magnets, these buckyballs, you can buy them. They're little really powerful magnets. You can make a helical virus. So here I am making one. They're, you just chain them all together and then as you wrap them they will form a wonderful uh, helix, which is basically how these viruses are built. Of course, what's missing here is the viral RNA. These are just the protein subunits. So each magnet uh, is a single coat protein of tobacco mosaic virus, and they make a perfect helix. You can make it any diameter you want. And if you come to my office for office hours, you'll see this uh, sitting on my desk. And I leave it there, and everyone who comes to my office to talk to me invariably will pick it up and start playing with it. Many people break it and the piece, it's fine, I don't mind. But it's very instructive to, to, to pick it up. And people have actually, I started out with just silver buckyballs and then over the years people donated different colors so now we have a multicolor. So this is very instructive I think for telling you exactly how these helical viruses are built. Plant, vi uh, plant viruses, I showed you tobacco mosaic viruses are built with this kind of symmetry. So are animal viruses, so are viruses that infect uh, all, all kinds of animals, but they always have a membrane around this helical structure. All right, so here is the uh, helical capsid of a virus called Sendai virus. It's related to measles virus, the, one of the viruses that Chris Christie thinks you should have a choice in being immunized against. And it's the same as tobacco mosaic. It's an RNA coiled in the middle. It happens to be negative stranded RNA for these viruses, so it doesn't matter what the polarity is. And you can see the coat protein subunits are all bound in a helical structure. This happens to be much longer uh, than that of tobacco mosaic virus. But these, as I said, for animal viruses, these helical capsids are always within an envelope. For some reason, they, they can't exist naked and travel and be successful in infecting hosts. And so here is an electron micrograph at the bottom 
of two uh, measles virus particles. And this one is broken open. You can see the nuclear capsid spilling out. It's quite long, um, and so it's bending. But this is it. This, if this were tobacco mosaic virus, you know, it would, be, it would be much shorter than the length of this genome, and they would be naked. But again, for animal viruses, these, these, these capsids built with helical symmetry are envelope. Now, this in measles virus would be the nucleocapsid because it's, it's a subassembly within the virus particle. So the RNA protein complex is called a nucleocapsid because it's inside uh, of an envelope. That's what a nucleocapsid is. Here's one more example of an animal virus uh, whose structure is helical, is built with helical symmetry, and that's vesicular stomatitis virus, which is related to rabies virus. This is very unusual bullet-shaped particle. Uh, on the left is an electron micrograph. It doesn't have very good detail because this is a, a non-stained frozen particle that was used to do cryo-EM and that was the data that they got from that was used to make the reconstruction on the right. So here is the complex of the RNA with the capsid protein. In this case it's called the N protein so it's different for each virus and you can see it coils around just like TMV, just like Sendai virus. There's also a, another protein outside of it and then a membrane on the outside. But at one end, it's, it's got a bullet-shaped cap. The other end is flat, more or less. Uh, this end is, is bullet-shaped. We don't know why this is. This is the way it, it assembles. And of course, that's very different from Sendai and tobacco mosaic virus. And on the right is just to show you the structure of the N protein. Here's a single N protein here. So it's kind of a bilobed protein. In the middle, there's a groove, and that binds RNA. So this green molecule passing through here is RNA. So many of these interact with the RNA and with each other uh, to form this spiral helical capsid. So that's it for helical symmetry. It's very simple, uh, and it explains the structure of many viruses. There are lots of, as I said, viruses infecting animals that have this kind of symmetry in their nucleocapsid, because all of them are envelopes, so we call them nucleocapsid. So for example, measles and mumps viruses uh, I showed you the nucleocapsid of a, of a measles-like virus. There it is in the middle of this particle. It's, it's, again, protein and RNA in a helical configuration. And it's within a membrane or an envelope, as shown here. Here is uh, rhabdoviruses. Again, the bullet-shaped virus is a helical nucleocapsid in an envelope. Influenza viruses have the same configuration. Uh, helical nucleocapsids, they happen to have eight pieces of nucleocapsid, that is protein plus RNA. But it's the same principle for building them. Even Ebola viruses are built this way. The RNA protein is built with helical symmetry. Okay, so all of these are uh, animal viruses that happen to be built with uh, helical symmetry. They happen to be all uh, negative strand RNA viruses. And they illustrate what the nucleocapsid is. If that's, again, this RNA protein assembly that is within the virion. Now, also on this slide, just for your information as a side point, you can see in the VSV and in the, the measles uh, diagrams, there are little, these little yellow balls at one end. There's just one of them. What do you think that might be? Remember, these are negative strand viruses. It's an enzyme, right? It's not, it could be reverse transcriptase if it were a retrovirus, but it's the RNA polymerase. Remember, they have, negative strand viruses have to bring the polymerase in with the particle. And you can see it in some of these uh, diagrams. They're actually also present at the end of each influenza virus uh, RNA segment. All right, which of the following describes virus symmetry and self-assembly? One, the bonding contacts are usually covalent. Two, each subunit always has identical bonding contacts with its neighbors. The bonding contacts of subunits are usually non-covalent. Each subunit has different bonding contacts with its neighbors. Or maybe none of those are right. Yeah, so this took a little longer because you're a bit uh, confused. Okay, so this is a little tricky. Most of you, 63% got to see the bonding contacts are usually non-covalent. And that is something that I, I had on one of the slides. That's absolutely correct. Um, let's look at the others. So you, you're perfect. They're, they're never covalent. They're not usually covalent. 
uh, they're usually co non-covalent. A lot of you took B. Each, each subunit always has identical bonding contacts with its neighbors. So a former student once said to me, whenever you use always in a question, that means it's false. You have to, and, and that's the trick, always. Nothing is ever always, right? Um, as you will see in a moment, I, and I put in one of the slides, identical in quotes, because the bonding contacts are sometimes identical, but not always, and so that's not correct. But it will be more clear uh, in a moment why that's wrong. And in fact, we're going to start talking about that now. All right, so we talked about how to make rod-shaped viruses. <laughs> that's fine. What about the spherical ones, which I have up here? Polio and, well, polio, basically. How do you make a spherical virus? It's easy to imagine wrapping those magnets together to make a helical one. And there are two clues. So here is the problem. You have a spherical virus on the right here. This is poliovirus. But the proteins that make it up, are, they don't look spherical at all. So how does this work? So there are two clues to the answer to this. One is that these round viruses have precise numbers of proteins. They're always multiples of 60. And common ones are 60, 180, 249, 60, et cetera. All right? And the second clue is that even though spherical viruses come in many sizes, they're tiny ones and they're really big ones, capsid proteins are usually between 20 and 60 kilodaltons. So you can't just make a bigger virus by using bigger proteins. That's the point of that. All right? So you have some kind of multiple of 60, and the, the capsid proteins don't get any bigger. So people thought about this for a long time, how to solve this problem. And uh, these two guys, Casper and Klug, figured it out in the early 60s. Uh, these guys got the Nobel Prize for this work. So they knew from Watson and Crick, which I told you about before, that these round capsids are, are icosahedrons. Remember in that Watson and Crick slide, I said platonic polyhedra. And that's of, uh, icosahedron is, of course, a platonic polyhedra. But that's the only one that is used to build these kinds of round viruses, the icosahedra, not any of the others. And they also found that the capsid subunits tend to be arranged as pentamers and hexamers. They, they learned these things by studying uh, virus structure. So with these pieces of information, they came up with the idea that these round viruses are built with what we call icosahedral symmetry. So the polio is sitting on the table there. It's round, but the way its proteins are arranged is by icosahedral symmetry. They're not actually icosahedrons, because icosahedrons are, you know, are these uh, solids, uh, these polygon solids with uh, 20 faces. Each face is an, uh, is an equilateral triangle, so 20 faces. And um, that, makes you, that allows you to have a closed shell. And it turns out, why do viruses pick or use icosahedral symmetry? Because this allows you to make the smallest a closed shell that's very stable with the smallest number of subunits. So you can take 60 copies of a single protein and make a closed shell, and uh, you can put your viral genome in it. And none of the other solids apparently can do that. So an icosahedron has 20 of these uh, equilaterally triangular faces. When you do this, when you build an icosahedron, one of the properties of it are these rotational axes of symmetry. So here they're labeled five-fold axis in green, uh, two-fold axis in blue, and three-fold axis in, in red. And these are very, very simple. It means nothing more than there, than there are that many subunits around each axis. So around the five-fold axis, you can see there are five equilateral triangles. Uh, around the three-fold axis, there are three uh, of these lines, which don't actually exist in the particle, but which consist of proteins. And the two-fold has two on either side. So you can see three-fold. Five-fold from the top, one, two, three, four, five, and two-fold, two subunits around it. All right, so this is how spherical viruses are built, using icosahedral symmetry. So the two ways we've talked about, we have helical symmetry, we have icosahedral symmetry. This accounts for most of the viruses out there, but not all of them, as we'll see later. So how do you do this and build a virus? So this is the simplest virus with an icosahedral capsid that we know of. You can take, again, one protein and repeat it 60 times, and you, and you can make a closed shell uh, such as this one. Of course, they have to be the right protein. They have to be a capsid protein that has evolved to self-assemble to do this. You can't take any protein and expect it will make this kind of a shell. And note that it is spherical. It is not polygonal in shape, as is the icosahedron. The, the point is we're 
or using the symmetry of an icosahedron to build a particle. So the particle ends up being spherical. Now for these viruses, the protein subunit is the structural unit. So here, each of these commas is a protein, a single polypeptide chain. And that happens to be also the structural unit. As I told you earlier, sometimes the structural unit can be made up of different proteins, several different proteins. But for these simple ones, it's the same thing as the, the polypeptide or the protein subunit. And in this kind of virus, all the interactions of these proteins, these commas with each other, are identical. They have head-to-head -head and tail-to-tail -tail interactions, okay? And that's why initially Watson and Crick said these, these interactions were identical. In the helical viruses, they certainly all are identical. But you'll see in a moment, they're not always identical in these icosahedral capsids. Okay, so that's how you build an icosahedral virus, by taking identical subunits, repeating them. They have good interactions among each other, so they're stable, extensive interactions, but they're not covalently bounded to each other. They can come apart and release uh, the genome, and that's very important. So what's an example of this? Um, an a, a virus called adeno-associated virus 2, which is a parvovirus. Uh, these are viruses with a single-stranded linear DNA genome, which is diagrammed at the upper right here. We talked about this uh, last week. And these are icosahedral capsids built with icosahedral symmetry. They have the single-stranded uh, DNA inside. They're about 25 nanometers in diameter, and they're made of 60 copies of a single capsid protein. So here's the capsid protein right here, and it's color-coded so you can see what parts of it uh, give rise to the capsid structure, which is on the right. So the structure is derived by uh, cryo-EM or X-ray crystallography, probably uh, X-ray crystallography. And you can see the axes of symmetry. So for example, look at the blue area. There's one, two, three, four, five copies of this blue area on the protein on the left. That's the five-fold axis of symmetry. And similarly, there are three and two-fold axes. That's all that means, that there are that many uh, copies of a protein around it. All right, so that's a really simple uh, virus, 60 copies of a single capsid protein, but it works very well. It's quite successful and quite stable. Now note that there's another number on here I've been, I'm going to start showing you on these slides where this one says T equals 1. I'm going to explain this in a moment. This is the triangulation number. Now, that, not all viruses are that size, of course. Many viruses are bigger. So how do you make bigger virus particles? Again, you don't make bigger protein subunits. I told you they're all about the same size for all the viruses, about 20 to 60 kilodons in size. What you do is you just add more subunits to the particle. And so here is an example of a, of a slightly bigger virus. We now have 180, in this case, identical protein subunits. So you could take the same subunit and just pack more into the capsid and it gets bigger. Or you can use different proteins. It, both strategies work. And this changes things a bit when you do that. So that now we're getting away from identical interactions of the proteins that build a virus. So for example, now we have um, three different kinds of subunit interaction. By the way, this, this outline in blue here uh, is the structural unit. Uh, and now the polypeptides that make up, the, the individual polypeptides are no longer the structural unit. We have three modes of subunit packing, which I've labeled orange, yellow, and purple. So here's an orange kind of interaction, there's a yellow kind of interaction, and a purple kind of interaction. And I think if you look at this, you'll see that not all of these interactions are identical. For example, uh, these, some of these guys are in units of five, one, two, three, four, five, and that's of course a five-fold axis. But you can see also that there are some subunits that are arranged in arrays of six, like the purple here, one, two, three, four, five, six. And there's another one and another one. At each five-fold axis, there's an arrangement of five, but elsewhere there's an arrangement of six. So that's why we say we now have pentamers and hexamers. And this is what happens when you start making bigger capsids. Once you get away from the simple one with 60 subunits, where you only have five, five-fold, three-fold, and two-fold interactions, when you make bigger viruses, you now have six-fold interactions, or hexamers as well. So the interactions here are not all the same throughout the protein, throughout the capsid, right? 
you, they can't be because if you have pentamers and hexamers, by definition, the interactions are going to be different. That's why we say uh, that these are not identical interactions among all the subunits, but we call them quasi-equivalent. And Casper and Klug, those guys who figured this out, recognized this because they were studying bigger viruses, and they said, well, we thought it would be identical, but as you get bigger, they're not totally, so we call it quasi-equivalent. So that's quasi-equivalence. When a capsid has more than 60 subunits, when you want to make a bigger capsid, each occupies a quasi-equivalent position. They're similar, very similar, but not exactly, not chemically exactly the same. All right, so the bonding properties are similar, but not identical. And again, the best way to remember that is that they're hexamers and pentamers. So they're different environments in each one. So they have to be quasi-equivalent. So here's another example of one of these larger viruses. This is a polyomavirus called SV40. And polyomaviruses are those that all of you have and you excrete in your urine most of the time. They replicate in your kidneys. They don't seem to harm you. Uh, this happens to be a monkey version of, of one of those viruses. It has a double-stranded circular DNA genome. And this is the icon for the particle that you'll see throughout uh, these slides. These are slightly bigger, 50 nanometers, as opposed to the, what was it, 25 or so of the parvoviruses. It has a higher T number, and we'll explain that in, the mi in a minute. And this um, virus is made up of 360 subunits. It's made up of 72 pentamers of a single capsid protein called VP1. And you can see the way this is colored here. Here's one of these uh, pentamers of VP1. One, two, three, four, five. So five copies of a single protein form what's called a pentamer. And then this one is, happens to be at the five-fold axis of symmetry. One, two, three, four, five uh, pentamers around it. But there are also six-fold associated pentamers, if you will. And you can find uh, uh, them all over. Here's one, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this pentamer is surrounded by six other pentamers. All right, so at each, just like the... A large virus example we mentioned, uh, some subunits are surrounded by five subunits and some are surrounded by six. So this is quasi-equivalent structure and it's again how you make a, a larger virus. All right, what is this triangulation number that I've been showing you now or the T number? So there are, there are a couple of ways you can look at this and I'm going to give you a simple way. In the textbook, if you're interested, is the, is the more complicated mathematical version. But the way you should really understand this is that the triangulation number is no more than the number of facets on each triangular face of the icosahedron. So remember, each the icosahedron has 20 triangular faces and the number of facets or subunits that you pack into that face is the T number. So here, for example, the T number is 1 uh, because there is one structural unit making up uh, that T equals 1 capsid. All right, T equals 1 on the left. On the right is a triangulation number of 4. Now you can see that it's bigger. And that's one of the reasons I want to tell you about triangulation number, because this is what accompanies making a bigger capsid. Here's uh, a one of those equilateral triangular faces of the icosahedron, of which there are 20, right? Now you can see there's one, two, three, four facets, or four subunits within that face. So that's why it's t equals four. This is t equals one on the left. This is t equals four. And you can see what you've done is simply pack in more subunits, and the virus is getting bigger. So as the virus gets bigger, the T number gets bigger. And of course, you also generate uh, the six-fold axis of symmetry into, in addition to the five-fold, as we talked about before, pentamers and hexamers. Okay, That's how you make a larger virus. You put in more triangular facets. That's essentially what we're doing, and we're increasing the T number. So here's a slide that perhaps illustrates this better. Um, here, is, here are the different T numbers on these particles in the, in the third column here. Uh, so on the left is the uh, structural unit for a T equals 1 virus. This, this triangular face or this structural unit has one uh, subunit in it or one facet. And when you build the virus, you get a T equals 1 particle. Again, these are the simplest particles with just 60 uh, protein subunits. 
Uh, and the number of total subunits in a particle can be obtained by multiplying the triangulation number by 60 for the most part. So that's t equals 1. t equals 3, you now have three facets per triangular face of the icosahedron. You can see 1, 2, 3. That's the, su the structural unit is on the left. Now you have three facets. You've packed in more capsid proteins until the virus is getting bigger. It's a t equals 3. A t equals 12, sorry, a t equals 4 has now one, two, three, four facets per icosahedral triangular face. So it's getting even bigger, there's 240 subunits, and this guy is t equals 13, has 13 subunits in the triangular face. So I call them facets, that's what each of these little uh, subunits is. You're simply packing more proteins into this capsule to make it bigger, and it's done on a regular basis because this is all symmetrical. So that's why the t number uh, can describe how the virus gets bigger. Which of the following are characteristics of icosahedral symmetry in viral capsids? One, producing a solid with 20 faces, each an equilateral triangle. Two, allows formation of a closed shell with 60 identical subunits. Three, fivefold, threefold, and twofold axes of symmetry. Four, the T number describes the number of facets per icosahedral face, or all of the above. 85% of you got all of the above, which is correct. Everybody, everything is right. Um, makes a solid with 20 faces. That's the definition of the icosahedron, each equilateral triangle, 60 subunit, closed shell, 5, 3, and twofold axes of symmetry, and the T number describes the number of facets, right? Now, uh, you can make pretty big capsids just the way I've told you. You simply add more and more subunits. But there's some viruses that are even more complicated because they have other proteins than just the ones that make up the shell. So you could take one or a couple of different capsid proteins and in increase the number and make a bigger and bigger capsid. But among the larger viruses, we, have, we see other proteins present that have other functions. And this is an example of that. This is adenovirus. This very unusual icosahedral virus with the uh, Sputnik-like appearance. Uh, these are 150 nanometer capsids. They're, they have a T equals 25 number, uh, and they have 720 copies of one protein and 60 copies of a second. And at each of the five-fold axes of symmetry, there is one of these fiber proteins. So you don't, the icosahedral symmetry doesn't require, for example, these fibers sticking out. But they have other functions in the viral life cycle. They bind to the cellular receptor. So that's an example of an extra kind of protein that we find in bigger virus particles. There are also other proteins stuck in among the subunits that make the icosahedral shell. You can see them labeled here uh, with different names. Uh, and, and they have functions as well. They're thought to be a kind of glue that keeps the, the proteins together, for example. And there are also lots of proteins in the interior uh, where the nucleic acid is. So the point here is that as you make really big viruses, you tend to have other proteins other than those that make up that capsid. You can build a great capsid with just a couple of proteins. But as you get bigger and bigger, you tend to have uh, other proteins with other functions as well, like this uh, fiber protein. All right, so that's one example. I want to give you two more. Here's another example of a complicated virus where um, you do something different. And this is real virus. These are viruses with double-stranded RNA genomes. And the real virus that infects us is the rotavirus, which causes gastroenteritis. These are unusual because they're composed of two icosahedral shells. There's an inner shell here, which is made up of VP3 proteins that has a T equals 2 symmetry. And then there's another shell around it, which happens to have T equals 13 symmetry. They're both icosahedral shells. Basically, we have a double layer of protection here. We have an outer icosahedral shell and an inner one. So again, this, this serves a function, as you will see. Uh, this, this works during entry of the virus into cells. Uh, but it's another example of how you do things slightly differently to make bigger particles. These are T equals 13 on the outside and they're 70 to nanometer uh, particles. Bacteriophages with tails. These are among the first viruses to be discovered and studied. These are viruses that infect bacteria. They're pretty big and they're pretty complicated, but they're really made up of largely the elements that we've been talking about. So you can see there is a head in which the DNA of these viruses is stored. And this is nothing more than an icosahedral capsid, just like uh, the ones we've been talking about. It happens to be elongated, but it's built with the same principle. It's taking 
a few capsid proteins, repeating them many times to make a very stable shell. Uh, this particular tailed phage also has a, um, a contractile tail, which begins, which is attached to one five-fold axis of the icosahedral head and goes all the way down to the base plate. And you can see by looking at this structure that it is basically built with helical symmetry. Just like those rod-like viruses, that's all this is. Uh, this is built with that kind of symmetry. And so it's two kinds of symmetry stuck together to form one virus. Uh, the other unusual parts of this particular virus, there's a base plate here at the bottom, which is expanded here on the right. And this is important for attaching to the bacterial host. Uh, the phages recognize the host through this base plate interactions, and you'll see the DNA eventually passes through. So the DNA is stored in the head at huge pressure. I mean, the, P the pounds per square inch of the DNA here is amazing. And uh, what happens is when this phage interacts with the right bacterial host, uh, that DNA shoots out. Uh, there's a spike underneath this base plate that punches a hole into the host cell. Uh, and the DNA comes out. Some of these actually contract as a way of getting the DNA out, but not all of them. So let's take a look at this base plate, because it's really an unusual structure. This is more of a classical protein structure at the bottom here, made up of just a few proteins, not highly repetitious. Um, here's the base plate from a bottom view. So you can see on this particular phase, <coughs> there is a spike. And that drives into the membrane and makes a hole in the DNA then we'll go through that hole from the head. And the structure of just this spike was solved by x-ray crystallography a couple of years ago. And it's shown on the right here for two different phages. And I think this is so amazing because, you know, these, had been, these were called spikes years ago because they pierce. But they look like knives. It's amazing. Look, look at this. They're built of mostly beta strands at the top. But then the beta strands here are aligned in such a way to make a spike. And they get shorter and shorter and shorter. And then at the very tip, there are some uh, loops of protein that are held together by a couple of, uh, by an iron ion, okay, to keep it really sharp. So this absolutely looks like its function. It looks just like a spike that would uh, pierce through a membrane. Really amazing. And finally, the last complicated virus I want to talk about is herpes simplex virus. Again, this is built with icosahedral symmetry. There's a capsid inside which is shown here. We show icosahedra schematically, but, uh, schematically by the polyhedral shape. And there's a double-stranded DNA genome inside. But this uh, particular virus uh, capsid happens to be enclosed in an envelope. So you can see there's a lipid envelope around it. So it would be called a nucleocapsid because it's a subassembly within the virus particle. This is a standard uh, icosahedral capsid. It's quite large. It's T equals 16 and 200 nanometers in diameter. But what's unusual is that one of the five-fold axes is a, is a pore. And that's shown right here. So here's the particle. And uh, here is, the, one of the, is one pore that's on this particle. It's stained in a way so you can visualize it here and here. And here's the model of its structure. And this is the outer part and the inner part. So one five-fold axis is different from the rest of all the others. And this is actually a pore that lets DNA go in during packaging and lets DNA go out when the virus infects the cell. And here are just some other views of it. Here's just the icosahedral capsid alone. Uh, these are the five-fold axes of symmetry, one of which is this pore. And here you can see a top view of the pore. And, and you can see that the middle is actually open, allowing the DNA to get in or out. So this is an example of a specialized structure in an icosahedral capsid. It's called the portal to let the DNA get in or out. Now, we've talked a bit so far about some of these viruses that have envelopes. Both the helical uh, capsids and these icosahedral capsids can be encased in an envelope. Uh, and this is, of course, a lipid bilayer. It comes from the host cell because the, the virus cannot make lipids. It can't make membranes. So it has to be encased in, in those from the host cell. And these are typically acquired by a process we call budding. And that's shown here. Uh, a part of the plasma membrane, or whatever the membrane happens to be, uh, becomes a bud and eventually pinches off to, to form a virus particle. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that. But that's essentially how 
the envelope is acquired. Now this budding can happen at the plasma membrane, it can happen in the ER, the Golgi, it can even happen through the nuclear membrane. So where the membrane is acquired varies, but the process always involves this kind of procedure. And the viruses that do this, that bud and have an envelope, they can have either helical or icosahedral symmetry. So the nucleocapsid can be of either flavor. So this is uh, what the viruses look like with envelopes. This is an electron micrograph of influenza virus. And as I mentioned earlier, when these were first noticed, they called these projections on the outside of the virus particles spikes, because they looked like spikes. Well, they turn out to be proteins embedded in the lipid membrane. These are integral membrane proteins. They're, they're schematized on the right here. So here's a diagram of the viral membrane. This is derived from the cell, of course. <laughs> And here are viral glycoproteins that are embedded in this membrane. So this is a virus-specific protein. There's typically a part outside of the particle. There's, of course, a transmembrane domain, and then typically an interior domain as well. And these make oligomers typically on the membrane, and that's why they look like spikes. So each of these spikes on this hemagglutinin of influenza virus is a trimer, for example. These have very important functions. They attach to cell receptors. They do other things as well. Uh, that's usually the function of the exterior part. And the interior sequences of these proteins play roles in virus assembly. All right, so the envelopes of viruses always have at least one viral protein in them. Uh, otherwise, it would just be a cell envelope and it wouldn't behave like a virus. The glycoproteins that are in these envelopes uh, vary. Some of them are perpendicular to the membrane, like the influenza virus glycoprotein that's stuck in there. It's called the hemagglutinin. Uh, it's perpendicular. And you can see on this reconstruction of the influenza virus that they project from the plane of the membrane. So the uh, blue molecules here are the hemagglutinin. You can see that there's also a red molecule on the influenza virus. That's a different glycoprotein that has a different function. Uh, some viruses, like flaviviruses, yellow fever virus, West Nile virus, the glycoproteins are actually flat on the membrane, shown here in this structure. So here's the viral membrane below, and this uh, flavivirus glycoprotein is lying flat on the viral membrane. And you can see in this cryo-EM reconstruction on the bottom, it's in fact how they, it's very different from the, the way it looks in the influenza virus. These proteins are lying flat on the membrane. But nevertheless, they, they have the same functions as the flu HA. They will bind receptors and they will lead to virus entry. And those are processes we'll talk about uh, next time. So here are some examples of viruses that are enveloped uh, and have either helical nucleocapsids or icosahedral nucleocapsids inside. So let's start with the top. Uh, here's influenza virus on the top left. The nucleocapsid is helical. There are eight pieces of it but they're still helical, RNA wrapped in protein, right? With that repeating uh, symmetry that we talked about early on. And then there's an envelope around it. The envelope has glycoproteins in it. Ebola virus, exactly the same. It just have, has a filamentous shape as opposed to, to spherical, but the genome of Ebola virus is a helical nucleocapsid, RNA combined with protein, and the whole thing is surrounded by a membrane, and it also has glycoproteins in the membrane as well. We call these unstructured envelopes because they're, in the case of flu and other viruses, they're spherical. They can vary in size and, and shape even, and the, the, the Ebola viruses are filamentous. They can vary as well. They can be very long or they can be rather short. In contrast, when you put an envelope around an icosahedral capsid, sometimes the capsid conveys to the envelope on the surface some kind of symmetry. So we call these structured. So here's an example. You've seen already a photograph of this. This is a flavivirus like, uh, like yellow fever or West Nile. Uh, it's composed of a icosahedral capsid, which is shown in the blue here. And the RNA genome is inside it. So that would be the nucleocapsid. But then it's surrounded by a membrane, which is the light pink. And in the membrane is the, uh, the glycoprotein, which in this case is lying flat on the surface. So these glycoproteins, as you can see, have a symmetry. Look, here's a five-fold axis of symmetry. One, two, three, four, five. And there are three and two-fold axes as well. That's because the underlying capsid is conveying to the glycoproteins the symmetry. You don't see any similar symmetry in the flu or the Ebola virus uh, virions because they're unstructured. 
Same thing with uh, hepatitis B virus, which is shown on the right here. Uh, you have an icosahedral capsid surrounded by the envelopes, and you can see an ordering of the glycoproteins on the surface uh, as a consequence. Those two kinds of symmetry, helical and, and icosahedral, pretty much account for most of the viruses. However, there are exceptions, and some of them are shown on this slide. We have pox viruses um, and the giant viruses like Pandora virus and pithovirus. These look weird, and we really don't understand how they're built. They're not built with helical symmetry. They don't seem to be built with icosahedral symmetry. Uh, you can see that uh, they have weird structures, like these two viruses, the pitho and the pandora, have a pore, apparently, at one end of the particle. Uh, here, it's got these striations. And on the left, there's just a seal. We think this is how the DNA uh, gets out of these particles. But the point I want to tell you is that uh, helical and icosahedral symmetry don't account for all viruses out there. There are many that are built in ways that we don't understand. Maybe one day we'll understand how they are built. But for now, I leave you with the fact that uh, there are some structures that uh, don't make sense in terms of the symmetry and interactions that we've talked about today. So you can have viruses made up of uh, capsid proteins. The simplest ones just have 60 copies of a capsid protein. You can get bigger viruses with more capsid proteins and other proteins as well that serve other functions. And then as very big viruses get made, you have ancillary proteins as well. So there are all kinds of other components that are found in virus particles that we'll encounter uh, as we go through this course. Many viruses have enzymes in the particle. For example, polymerases, we talked about how some RNA viruses with negative strand genomes have to bring in an RNA polymerase, reverse transcriptase for some viruses. Uh, some viruses actually have proteases in the particle to help mature the particle as it's being formed. Uh, a variety of other enzymes that are needed for uh, replication. There are also a variety of cases where viruses have things that are needed for mRNA synthesis, so-called activators of transcription. Uh, proteins that are needed for efficient uh, transcription of mRNAs. And some viruses even package cellular components like histones, tRNAs, all sorts of uh, lipids and other proteins and, and molecules as well. So we've largely concentrated on the proteins that build the structure of the virus particle. But I, I just want you to understand that there are other things in there as well. Even the simple poliovirus particle, which is three different proteins, four different proteins repeated 60 times each. There's a lipid that's present in this particle as well. It doesn't contribute to the structure of the particle, but it has functions. And those kinds of molecules we're going to be encountering as we go through this course. <laughs>